When you think about the concept of privilege in mixed martial arts, I'm sure a few names immediately come to your mind. Conor McGregor, Sage Northcutt, Paige Van Zant, just to name a few. These fighters are sometimes accused of skipping the line and even getting opportunities that they just didn't work for and don't deserve. With the three names I just listed, yeah, I have to admit, a fair share of privilege has been given to these fighters in the past. Conor seems invincible and always calls the shots, yet he really did work for what he has. Paige was a young female star who exploded onto the scene, but to be fair, her UFC career has almost faded into obscurity at this point. And Sage, well, he had a flashy style and looked like he was chiseled out of stone, but his UFC career is over and he's off fighting in Asia with his sister now. All of these fighters had something in common that Dana thought he could use, and that's their marketability. An attractive face, a cocky attitude, that's just how the UFC makes money. Whatever Dana thinks can eventually put asses in seats and eyes on the TV. It may not be right, but at least you can understand why more opportunities were given to these fighters. However, the most privileged fighter that I've ever seen is actually not one that I just named. And to be honest, I'm actually blown away with how many undeserved opportunities this guy's been given. And that's the thing, he doesn't just get undeserved opportunities, he gets them and then completely blows it. And then guess what, a couple months later, his next privilege is served up on a silver platter. For those of you who don't know who I'm talking about by now, it's a man-child by the name of Kevin Lee. A fighter so undeserving that you'd think he's secretly the son of one of Dana's old mistresses, and I'm not even joking. But before I dive into Kevin Lee's recent years of ruining undeserved opportunities, let me briefly explain his history in the UFC and how he got to where he is today. An undefeated Lee made his UFC debut in early 2014 against Al Iaquina after destroying competition on the regional scene. He got dropped early in the fight, and he couldn't really seem to implement his wrestling like he wanted to. He eventually lost a unanimous decision here, but many people thought it was an impressive performance due to the fact that Al had made waves on the Ultimate Fighter and was on a two-fight win streak himself. After his debut against Al, Kevin went on a streak of his own, winning four fights, including impressive wins over Michelle Prezeras and James Muntasri. This streak earned Lee his first big opportunity in his career, and to be fair, he did earn this one. Lee was given a spot on the prelims of UFC 194, McGregor vs. Aldo, and for those of you that know the sport, you know how big of a deal it is to have a spot on a McGregor card. It just it gets you more money, more eyes, and if you win, more star power and name recognition. However, Kevin Lee did not win. Despite being the minus 600 favorite, he was brutally knocked out by jiu-jitsu practitioner Leonardo Santos in the first round. But listen, if there was ever a time in his life that Kevin Lee deserved some credit, it would be because of how he bounced back from this loss. He was able to go on an extremely impressive four-fight win streak with finishes over the likes of Jake Matthews and Francisco Trinaldo. This streak earned him his first main event against another recognizable name and Ultimate Fighter winner Michael Chiesa. The build-up to this fight was really what put Kevin on the map. As someone who could talk and, and someone who had a unique style, one of the most infamous press conference moments in UFC history occurred because Kevin Lee's trash talk hit Kiesa so hard. The only reason he took the fight is because it's an OKC. I'm going to carry him through this car. He's going to headline because of me. After that, he's going back to the prelims. But I just hope uh, he shows up because I know his mama got tickets. So Don't you ever talk about my fucking mom. Don't you ever talk about my fucking mom. Dad, I want to get the middle. Like, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to smack uh, the fuck out of you right now. Don't you ever talk about my mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never talk about yeah, yeah, yeah. What's After this press conference, Lee's popularity exploded and it became a rare occasion where a fighter's stardom began because of a press conference moment rather than a fight outcome. When it came to the test of facing Chiesa, Lee passed with flying colors. You can't really deny that. He destroyed Chiesa on the feet and in the grappling and eventually submitted him late into the first round. It was a controversial finish because Michael didn't actually tap and he appeared to be fine after the stoppage, but to ref Mario Yamasaki's credit, Michael wasn't going anywhere and I believe that he was about to go out for real. Let me be clear about something. Up until this point, Lee had earned every opportunity he was given. He bounced back from a bad loss and beat a well-known fighter in his first main event and at the press conference beforehand as well, if you want to count the don't talk about my mom thing. He could trash talk, he was a great fighter with finishing ability, he was a young kid from Detroit. It ain't nothing better than being young, black, and rich, so I'm going to keep it going. Everything about Lee fit the mold of a modern star in the UFC, and I'm sure Dana looked at Kevin and saw stacks and stacks of pay-per-view money in the future. Unfortunately for Kevin Lee, this is exactly where the UFC completely shit themselves and shoved Lee into fights and opportunities that he really just couldn't handle. See, the problem with Kevin Lee isn't his skills on the mic or in the cage, it's that his heart is two sizes too small. 
Next up, let me tell you about the complete downfall of Kevin Lee's UFC career. After his impressive win over Chiesa, Lee was given an interim title shot versus Tony Ferguson in his second straight main event. Before the fight, Lee showed almost sickening levels of cockiness in every single media obligation. After I beat Tony, then, then connor has got to prove that he's ready to fight me. Uh, go ahead, Tony. You, go ahead, Tony. You can respond. Hey, Tony don't see himself winning, so, I mean, it ain't even, you know, but go ahead. You can, I mean, you can respond, you know. You gonna he went from dressing hip and modern to straight up weird. It was obvious that he realized his journey to being the next McGregor had begun, and he kicked everything into overdrive to try to speed up the process. There was a couple problems with his choice, though. Lee was ranked number seven at the time, so many fans and fellow fighters even didn't agree that Lee was even close to earning a shot at the belt yet. Tony Ferguson was also on a much more impressive win streak, and his status as a fan favorite caused Lee's trash talk to anger fans rather than to attract them to his persona. I want to say thank you to my fans. I weighed in on time. I'm a professional, and I will continue to be professional. I'm going to teach this kid a lesson. He talks too much. People wanted to see him lose, and lose he did. Lee had weight issues before the fight, but he eventually managed to hit the mark. He also had early success against Ferguson standing and in the wrestling aspect. The first implication of Lee's immature and childish character was shown between rounds when he landed cheap shots on Tony after the bell and had to be pulled away by Herb Dean. Tony trying to escape, and he escaped, and a big round for Kevin Lee. And a strike after the round landed for Herb Dean immediately into the fighters. Let's see how he Shortly after this, Tony ramped up the pressure and began to win in all facets of the fight. He dropped Lee and eventually submitted him in the late third round. So Kevin Lee, a grown-ass man, literally stomped the ground like a toddler having a temper tantrum during the post-fight announcements. You'd think that Lee would be able to put together another win streak back to the top. However, the build-up to the Tony fight really just made Kevin delusional in my opinion, almost like he thought he beat Tony. He began saying he needed to fight Khabib next because he was the only one who could, quote, expose the holes in his game. And this is where the whole, like, Kevin Lee sees holes in your game meme originated from. His style is, it's good. It's obviously very good, but I can see a lot of holes. In it. Rather than scaling things back for Kevin, the UFC decided to give him his third straight main event versus Edson Barboza. Despite the fact that Lee didn't even deserve this opportunity after a bad loss, he missed weight and still seemed unapologetic about the whole ordeal. Lee was actually very successful in the fight, and despite being almost decapitated in the third round with a brutal wheel kick, he eventually won by Dr. Stoppage. So not only did Lee get an undeserved main event here, he didn't even take the opportunity seriously seeing as he missed weight. And this is where Kevin should have taken a step back and realized that, you know, he's been dropped in two straight fights and probably needs some time off to fix the holes in his game. But no, Kevin became as cocky as ever stating that, yeah, he could in fact destroy Khabib and he was a better version of Khabib and all this other stuff. So next, the closest thing that the UFC could give Kevin to Khabib was a rematch with his first career loss, Ally Quinta, who had just lost a unanimous decision to Khabib. So Lee was handed his fourth straight main event spot. Like usual, post Kiesa Lee talked a massive amount of shit that he couldn't back up, saying that Al hadn't changed his style and he was just the quote, same old Al. Despite being the minus 345 favorite, Lee was boxed up basically for the entire fight and he couldn't find the same wrestling success that he'd had against Edson. He lost his second unanimous decision to the real estate agent from Long Island. After the fight, Kevin Lee apparently was absolutely heartbroken. In the post-fight interview, he even stated that he thought there was no way he could have lost that fight, which just shows more of his delusion. So this is the point where the UFC should have realized, okay, this kid isn't able to take responsibility for his mistakes, and he's just losing star power every time we put him in a big spot for various reasons. So how about we scale him back to the prelims? Seems like it makes sense, right? But nah, next Kevin Lee geared up for his fifth straight main event, which is unheard of. This time against former champ Rafael Dos Anjos, who was on a losing streak and typically struggles against wrestlers at 170. So the UFC was catering to everything Kevin Lee needed at this point, and he still lost. Same old Kevin Lee came back out, had a semi-strong start, and then gassed out and was submitted in the fourth round. RDA later lost to Michael Chiesa earlier this year. The very man who kickstarted Kevin Lee's now ruined stardom, so I think that's pretty ironic. At this point, the UFC had screwed things up by giving Lee five straight main event spots. He was now too big of a name to just go straight back to the prelims, but he choked too easily to be given another top contender, so this kind of left him in a state of limbo. 
the UFC decided to give him a main event spot on the biggest pay-per-view of 2019, right? So it's still like a really big opportunity that he didn't deserve against undefeated Gregor Gillespie. Despite having an impressive record, Gregor hadn't fought anyone even close to Lee's level and he was promptly knocked out cold early in the first round. Gregor was pretty undersized for the division and just for reference, here's Kevin Lee beside Charles Oliveira who's billed in at 5'11 and who moved up from featherweight. And now here's Kevin Lee beside Gregor Gillespie at the faceoff. So you can just see the size difference right there. And Gregor also lacked the experience and cage time to fight someone with the experience of Lee. Yet Gregor was still the slight favorite, which is kind of a testament to Lee's flakiness at that point. The fans didn't really want to trust him. I'd love to be able to say like, yeah, this was the point that young Lee got his career back on track and he really found himself. But no, actually... Things just got even more bizarre for the immature man-child from the worst city in the United States. Gregor had mentioned in passing during an interview that he was a supporter of Trump, and that was only relevant because Trump was attending the event. And to be honest, Gregor's really just a soft-spoken fisherman who in no way was trying to politicize anything. However, Lee took the knockout win as an attempt to shame Gregor for his support of the president with a tasteless Instagram post that said, Bernie Sanders, you bastards, or something like that. And that part's not necessarily weird or out of character for Lee, considering he's obnoxiously cocky and delusional. But the most bizarre part of this situation was actually that Lee was invited by presidential candidate Bernie Sanders to be a guest speaker at a political rally. This was probably the stupidest thing that happened in the entire year of 2019. Kevin Lee literally got up there and started talking about Colby Covington in front of people who don't even know what MMA is. We all gonna take our lumps, but the man ran out the back door of T-Mobile Arena. And, and, and I'm not ashamed to, to, to stand up here and say it. Like, I, I fought in that same arena in 2017 for my first world title, and I lost it. I'm not ashamed to say that, but I stood up. I said my mistakes. My mama was sitting in front row again. Out of all the opportunities that Kevin Lee somehow gets without deserving, this was the one that made the least amount of sense. That entire shit show came from a simple IG post. Kevin probably began to view himself as a political figurehead or something, or like a member of Bernie's campaign after this rally, because he sure as hell wasn't training. In March of 2020, Kevin Lee was given his sixth main event out of his last seven fights. Now let me ask you guys a question. Do you think this man who has missed weight, lost fights, deserves a sixth main event? Despite training with Faraz Sahabi for this fight, Lee missed weight by two and a half pounds. Anytime I do and I say I'm going to do something, I'm always going to make sure I hold up my end and I'm going to do it. And probably looked the worst he's ever looked in the octagon. He had some classic, brief, early Kevin Lee success, but then he started to get knocked around the octagon on the feet and he eventually shot a sloppy takedown and was submitted with a guillotine choke. The worst part of this entire ordeal isn't that it was another undeserved main event, not even that he missed weight by almost three and a half pounds, and not even that he obviously didn't train for the fight. It was that he faked a tap and then tried to keep fighting. Of all the terrible yet completely brain dead things you can do during a fight, tapping and then saying you didn't tap on a worldwide broadcast might be up there with the dumbest cheating tactics of all time. Good for you, Charles Oliveira. You let him tap so that you wouldn't give the poor 27-year-old child CTE for the next two rounds. I mean, this Kevin Lee guy, he hits you after the bell, he fakes tapping, he misses weight, he's delusional, you give him rematches that he loses and then can't even, can't even accept the fact that he just lost. I just, I just don't understand why the UFC continues to give this guy so many opportunities. Six main event spots out of his last seven fights, he loses four of them, doesn't make weight for two. It just makes no sense. And then take into account that out of the entire UFC roster, this was the guy that was asked to speak at the rally of a presidential candidate. You know, I got to show the folks a little bit of style, you know. I'll give them, I'll give them for, the, for the camera too, you know. It's just so bizarre that it's almost funny at this point. I mean, if I didn't laugh about it, I would cry. The UFC is trying to force this dude into stardom so harshly that they don't even realize they just ruined his career for the last three years. I wouldn't be surprised if he got a main event spot in his return to the UFC. One thing is for sure though, this is the most privileged, undeserving, cheap, immature fighter in all of mixed martial arts and certainly in the UFC today.